everyone present, good evening, and uh, thank you to to create the time to participate to this other webinar on cultivating a culture of peace, which is uh, this year theme on uh, the International Day of Peace. Now, talking about uh, peace and looking at uh, looking at the world with its rising geopolitical tension and the protracted uh, conflict, and taking into consideration the, the rising intraspect conflict. I think this year, this year exercise of uh, celebrating peace, the 25th anniversary of peace worldwide, it is important for each and every one of us to have a minute of reflect on the essence of peace, on um, the importance of promoting and regarding a uh, culture of peace in our community at the local level and in our nation at the uh, general level. And we will equally engage at the international level by advocating for peace and advocating for the uh, uh, for, for peace building initiative and mediation in conflict affected regions. We, we look at the case of the Central Sahel with uh, several countries in the name of Burkina Faso, Somali, Niger, who have the police, Sudan, who see in the Sahel, who are becoming gradually uh, in neglect state conflict zone with uh, increasing humanitarian increasing humanitarian needs and increasing humanitarian casualties. A lot of people are suffering there. We are talking about a lot of millions of uh, internally displaced persons. Sudan alone has 10 million internally displaced persons, which is the world's largest internally displaced uh, population on Earth currently. Now, today, our topic of discussion, which is essentially focused on cultivating a culture of peace, we will have two speakers. First, we will have Epa, who is uh, a Commonwealth scholar, a Commonwealth scholar studying masters in uh, development study with a focus on conflict, with a with focus on conflict security and development. He is equally uh, a D A A D uh, scholar. That is the uh, German scholarship, um, Bushri uh, organ, where he be, he benefits as a student in Dortmund. We will equally have. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to shorten the introduction. We will equally have Mr. Ebune Bissinger, who is. Uh, who is a peace advocate and a youth leader. He has a DSC in international relations from the University of Goya. And he is going to talk about community-based peace building initiative. Why uh, Mr. Epa is going to talk about the role of AI in advocating for peace That said, uh, I would just like to ask uh, a few questions as to know, as to know, uh, Epa, are you, are you, are you, are you with us or are you, you know? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah I could, um, um, I'll share a few slides. I was trying to perfect the slides, but really, 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 I'm sorry. I left my uh, city um, here in Germany to the next city for some meetings, which are very urgent. And I started working on my slides and I got delayed with the train. They are doing some construction in the next city. So boom, I was tied up with the whole thing. I could not perfect the slides, but I'll um, do a presentation with what I have. I'll perfect it and you guys need it, then I can send it to you over. Okay. Yeah, it will always be good to have, have it. Mr. Ebune, are you with us? He is the second speaker. I think it's not there. 
Hello, hello, Danny good Lucky. evening, everyone. I think uh, okay, I think he just came in. Yeah, Mr. Ebune, welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are glad to have you among us to we'll talk on the topic Pleasure, of community-based community -based peace, initi peace building initiative. That's right. That's right. Okay. So am I to be the, uh, am I starting first or um, what position am I? The first speaker? Uh, all right, I, I think it is going to be uh, you, then later on, Epa. Okay, Why Epa that's is, fine. Why uh, Epa working on his slide? We'll mm -hmm. start with you. All right, no problem. That's fine. Good evening, uh, everyone. And happy International Peace Day. Uh, it is a pleasure sharing with you all, peace advocates or peace weavers, uh, this panel on the International Day of Peace. Well, thank you, Mr. Killian, for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with uh, each and everyone who is here present. And uh, you asked me to talk on... Uh, you have to talk on community community based peace building initiative, and mm -hmm. uh, I remember when we were discussing, uh, we, we we shared a conversation on uh, the area on which you presented your your presentation, yes. but it was not limited to that piece. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. And the, that is engaging local, local communities local in, collaborative in collaborative problem solving, problem solving, and building a network. Building mm -hmm. network and partnership for peace building efforts. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, a very okay. quick one. So first off, uh, I would like us to look at what the community is all about. Because if we're talking about um, engaging local communities into collaborative problem solving, we would like to look at what a community is all about. Now, you would want to note that a community uh, it's a group of people who share a particular vision or goal, and they are equally living in a particular uh, environment or working uh, together as one. So most times when we are talking about community collaboration, we try to see how we can bring in uh, members from this community, all stakeholders from this community to come hello. and share their hello. ideas. You said you may... hello? Um, oh my gosh, hello. For, Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to have interrupted this way. Uh, I think That's we okay. have some technical issue. First, uh, the name which room with which you sign in, uh, it's my name. And we have various participants here who would like at the end of the day to know more about you. Probably it will be important to sign in with your name. And equally, oh, okay. uh, we have people who are interested in your knowledge and they say knowledge attracts beauty so they would also like to have uh, an image of you if you could own your video while you are doing your presentation it would be great okay 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 that's fine uh sorry that i had to use your link because the first one you sent me uh was disturbing now my name is ebune melvin basinger and i am uh, a graduating student of uh, international relations from the University of Boya, who is looking forward to picking up uh, a postgraduate degree really? in. Oh, oh my really? goodness. And now, can you see me? Great. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, my network is terrible. That's why I had to put off, <laughs> that's why I had to put off uh, wow. my video. Yeah, so like I was saying, I am a graduating student from uh, the University of Boya International Relations, looking forward to uh, get myself enrolled for a master's program uh, uh, in conflict resolution. So uh, that is it for me. And uh, well, let, let's dive straight into our presentation for the day. 
Ah, uh, I'm not quite familiar you have, here. You have I would have loved to share, share my screen. Thing, yes, yeah. yes, yes, of course. I'm trying to see. Okay, beautiful. I got it. Uh, beautiful, 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 beautiful. I don't know. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we have a picture of screen. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. So uh, while working on it, I didn't complete my slide because of uh, one or two uh, issues, but I'm going to write on from here. So like I was saying, uh, a community who want to look at it to be a group of people sharing a common location, living together or working together and having the same vision and goal whose work and decision might affect one another. This is a community. And we could equally look a community to be, uh, in other words, like a mini ecosystem within any organization, area, city, or a country. That is first of uh, what a community is all about. Now we want to look at community engagement. What is community engagement all about? Well, community engagement, conversely speaking, um, can be defined as bringing together different stakeholders uh, of an issue and working with them to find solution to a common challenge or problem. Now, you all will agree with me that one of the biggest challenges we are facing in our world today is peace, conflict all over the world. We have uh, wars here and there, pockets of war here and there in almost all the continents in the world. And it's the talk of the day, especially with the UN, who are putting a hand on that to ensure that we try to see how we can bring about peace in our respective communities. And again, uh, one moment. I don't know if you can really see my screen in full. Yeah, we, we, we see a screen very well. What okay, community so engagement? Conversely mm -hmm. speaking, community we can see as can very well. Okay, yeah, I want to I want to stop sharing that particular one because I have another. I had difficulty building that particular uh, slide, but anyways, let let me just write down with what I have in front of me, and just in case you all will be needing this presentation, I'll definitely send it later on. Please, I hope you don't mind. Okay. Okay. So. So that is what community engagement is all about, bringing together all different stakeholders to ensure that we attain a particular goal uh, or objective. Now, uh, when we are looking at how we can get our communities engaged, the local community engaged into peace, peace building processes, we want to look at the different types of uh, community based approach to peace building. <laughs> The very first of it is, pardon, security. <clears throat> Security-based policing. Now, if we are talking about peace, those at the very local ends in our communities know exactly what is happening because they are being faced with these challenges every day. We want to get involved, even those of the vulnerable society, to ensure that they come together and see how we can affect our society by bringing about peace. So local policing is a system where we, we want to use the term uh, vigilantes, vigilante groups, where we can involve these local communities into working in partnership with the government and with the security uh, authorities like the police, whereby they work, I don't know if I would say on the ground to ensure that there is stability and calm in our various community. This is one of the ways we can we can ensure that we get every member in our different or respective uh, communities uh, actively involved into ensuring that we gain peace in our different communities. The next thing we want to look at or the next uh, 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 way we can get our communities involved into peace building is by social economic uh, recovery. Now, you would agree with me that most times when people are idle, they get themselves into one or two other activities. And uh, let me use, for instance, 
in my area because people were a little bit jobless or people are jobless when this whole thing which is happening in our country that we all know started lots of the youths decided to join the voices and became fighters but now if we look on how we can bring in different stakeholders who can help us in economic recovery social economic recovery activities we are going to go a long way preventing these youths or the, the, the number of youths who are supposed to join such violent activities will definitely reduce if they are busy, if they get themselves busy. It is definitely going to get um, uh, reduced. So we want to look at socioeconomic recovery. Another thing or another way we can help uh, curb the effect of conflicts in our communities or bringing local communities uh, into peace building processes is by media communication and civic engagement of course yes why not we want to use the media we have these tools at our disposal for, for almost free why can't we use our different social media handles like i see a couple of i've seen some names here in this meeting who i see them online doing a great job like uh madame uh, Orok. I, I i can see her name here and i can see equally uh epa someone i respect so much they have been using their platform to advocate for peace we can use our different social media platforms to advocate for advocate for peace in our different communities. We want to even maybe sometimes go to radio stations to preach peace. We want to teach people about civic edu education because our society today is getting decayed as a result of lack of civic knowledge. Most people feel to understand civic norms in our different societies and by so doing they turn to become violent but if we have a good mastery of civic education and if we continue to sensitize people advocate for peace i think it is going to go a long way to reducing the rate of violence in our different uh, respective societies and communities another thing we would like to look at is the traditional justice and reconciliation now, what is this all about? Traditional approach to justice and reconciliation often focus on uh, psychosocial and spiritual dimensions of violent conflicts. Traditional approaches are often inclusive with aim of reintegrating parties on both sides of the conflict into the community. Now we can get our, our traditional, we, we, we can go the look away with our tradition to get the different parties who are involved in the conflict into seeing how we can mediate and bring them to talk on a single table so that we can bring about peace. We can involve uh, a tradition. Uh, I think this, this uh, traditional justice and reconciliation system has equally worked in places like Rwanda. We talk about the gacha hacha and stuff like that. We've heard about it in Rwanda. And uh, the other one we have is heritage and cultural preservation. Innovative design to, preserve, uh, to, to preserve culture in disaster and conflict affected context have included communities forum in order to allow for the articulation of local needs, quick response on ground and uh, increased social capitals. Communities have also been involved in uh, in uh, inventing their culture, which has contributed to preservation and the sense of national identity. Now, we have different cultures in our different localities and communities. And I want to believe that our cultures are of peace. Most times we talk and preach peace in our different cultures. So if we can go back to the roots, if we can go back to our different cultures, to the roots, to bring out this aspect of peace, to preach about peace, to, to connect back with our ancestors and every other person or every other stakeholder who is involved in this. Because the, the, the process of bringing or preaching peace is not for just a particular class or it, it should not be left for some small group to handle this. It takes everybody. Everyone needs to get involved so much so that we can realize peace at the end of the day. So this is it for uh, some of the ways we can engage our local communities into collaborative uh, peace 
collaborative problem solving in our different communities. Now, let's look at uh, types of community institutions. We have different types of communities. I'm going to uh, institution. I'm going to list them. The very first one we have is association. Another one we have is cooperative. We equally have civic uh, association. We have community-based organization, that's CBOs. We have village leadership. All these different uh, institutions can go a very long way into ensuring that we realize peace in our respective communities and societies. Uh, one moment, my brother. Hold on a second. Oh my. So, okay. This thing is. Okay. One moment, sir. I'm trying to. Oh my gosh. So now, um, another thing, the next topic I'm supposed to discuss on is how to uh, build networks and partnership for peace building efforts. You know, in order for us to realize peace in our different communities, we need to collaborate with different stakeholders. We need to build partnership. We need to build networks and we need to do follow-up processes. Now, how can we, uh, what are some of the tips, practical tips of partnering for uh, peace building efforts in our different societies? The very first of it is we have developed a long-term strategy for the partnership as a way to enforce, foresee, and the scope to help and flow in donors' funding. We want to see how we can come up with a strategy, so much so that as we partner with other local organizations, with other stakeholders, we want to ensure that the funding keeps coming so much so that we can go right to the very grassroots. We want to go and touch the grassroots for us to be able to achieve our goals. Because if we just stay uh, maybe around the city centers, the big cities, the big towns, and we don't go to the grassroots, it becomes, or the countryside, it becomes really difficult for us to tackle this problem. We want to go to the core, and we should ensure that uh, the different stakeholders, especially those in the uh, funding department, the donors should be there with us, and we should come up with a strategy to ensure that we have a, a success at the end of the day. The next thing we want to look at is ensure clarity in communication and roles to manage risk and avoid tension, which can rise during joint project implementation. Of course, yes, wherever we have humans coming together, there are moments where we disagree, there are moments where we agree, and we should be able to learn how to communicate. Effective communication is key in partnering with other stakeholders as far as peace, uh, building efforts uh, is concerned. We want to ensure that we polish our communication skills so much so that we can be able to have uh, reasonable and effective conversations with our different partners and stakeholders. Uh, we want to equally define clearly the roles and the responsibilities of every partner that we're working with. People should be, there should be some sort of a effective delegation of roles. Once you give people their roles, tell them clearly, okay, this is what you have to do and this is what we expect from you. At the end of the day, you realize that people are going to deliver. But if we do not have this kind of, this sense of clear and effective communication, it becomes difficult for us to partner with local communities for peace building efforts. The very third uh, thing we would have to look at is approach capacity building as an opportunity for joint challenge share learning and reflection. We want to build capacity, of course. Mr. Kilian, I've been seeing you on social media doing great work with uh, WEM Africa. And I think the, the entire team of WEM Africa and other uh, organizations within and without Cameroon are doing a great job as far as preaching peace is concerned. 
this is what this is what we want to do uh another organization sorry but i have to mention this another organization which i see them doing a lot is um, um we built by mr epa and war cameroon they are doing so much as far as capacity building is concerned they always ensure that they do some sort of uh, annually workshop where they bring together youths from different parts of cameroon to empower them with the different skills and this is what we are, we are asking for for us to better partner with our local communities we need to build this kind of capacities as a joint effort to face this challenge because like i mentioned before it is not a problem for one person or a particular community but it involves every other person the fourth point we'll have to look at here is beware of and manage power dynamics in partnership this this one is something which <laughs> when you're, you're 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 trying to see how you can you can talk about peace and conflict in a particular society or community or country let me say so we need to understand power dy dynamics because different countries have different uh, uh, leadership roles or leadership styles and we would have to look at the power dynamics in these different uh, countries and communities because uh, power imbalance sometimes unavoidably between NGOs and local partners but discrepancies can be reinforced by way of resource or access to power holders uh power holders are managed now in as much as there are these discrepancies uh within the 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 the, 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 the system but if we go to look at or to target the leaders the elites in these different communities they can help us to achieving our objectives at the end of the day so we want to tackle them too as well. We want to look or take into consideration uh, the power, power dynamics in a particular country or society. Now, the fifth and last point we have here is find ways to measure and put a value on partnership. Yes, there should be some sort of a value on the partnership that we have in order for us to build peace in our different communities we need to add value to the kind of partnership. We need to partner and there should be some sort of value. Now, the investment in outcomes of partnership seems intangible and hard to measure. And hard to measure, let alone demonstrate to a donor. One way to capture the magic is to assign qualitative and quali uh, quantitative value to measure aspects of relationship that are valued and monitored how this change over time. We want to look at these things. We want to take into consideration the qualitative and the quantitative values and because they all change over time. We want to bring them into consideration or take them into account and see how we can bet, better partner with uh, the different stakeholders who are involved in peace building. Okay, um, Mr. Killian, that is it. That is what I prepared for us today. Just in case there's any question, I'll be willing to answer. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the rest of, thank you very much, Mr. Bruno, for uh, presenting um, on community-based initiatives, on community-based peace building initiatives, and uh, the various uh, network and peace building efforts in the community. And uh, right straightforward, without uh, any interval, we'll move to uh, Mr. Epa, who is going to talk about the role of AI in promoting peace in uh, this contemporary world. Hello, everyone. Hope you can see and hear me. Hello. Yes, you can hear me. Okay. Um, I'm going to presentation today on the role of AI in advocating for peace. And it's quite a very short one. And yeah, so diving right in, we understand how um, globalized our world has been recently hope you can see my screen 
Yeah, can you also explain, please? Think, yeah. We understand how globalized our world has been right? in such a way that when something happens today, we already know how what is happening in um, the U.S. And it is a very interconnected world. So the question is, how do we use this as a strategy of building and advocating for peace? It's a very um, difficult question to answer because advocacy, it's not a day's job. It does not happen for a day. It takes a moment, it takes time, it takes years to change a narrative. So we'll be looking at how inter intersected this AI is in terms of advocate in terms of peace advocacy. So going by it, we're going to look at the definitions of IAI and as well as of peace. I won't read the long definitions for you. you can always read it when I send you the, the slides. But when you look at AI, you're looking at this system. Um, an algorithm which is made in such a way that a system runs, it solves problem, just like how human beings do solve problem without the involvement of human beings. For example, if you go to Google and say, um, I'm the tallest person, Google automatically search in three trillion words to look at the tallest person in the world and the name, especially when it comes to like chat gpt where you can actually write things on chat gpt it refrains you and it, it gives you a sense of a particular thing when you look at peace building from another perspective and from the father of peace building uh, peace peace with them he defines peace as a situation or a society where there exists both negative and positive peace all this can be framed in his book which he wrote peace building by means peace building and peace and conflict development and civilization if you read the book which he wrote, he talked about constructive, negative and positive peace. And what is the nexus between this? So in the intersection between the topic of peace building and AI, it's very crucial. How do we use AI to preach peace? So we start looking at exploring the narrative of looking at AI. What is this system that um, it, it, it encourages and advocates for more people to know about a thing. Have you ever sat and think, and think about the, the, the innovative mindset of the people that created a phone in such a way that I am in Germany now, I'm doing a live Zoom call in Cameroon, and you are able to listen and follow up to a conversation we are having as if I, was, I am in Cameroon. How connected is it that you send an email to someone in the South in the, in the South America and the person yes it this person in Cameroon picks up writes or sends something a minute it WhatsApp message in the next minute your brother in Canada or the US already has it so when we look at this we start looking at how AI is increasing playing a very in, interesting role in peace ranging from different things early. Um, conflict warning detection and promotion of inclusive dialogue. We start looking at humanitarian responses. We start looking at international diplomacy and things like that. So the first one we're going to look again from the discussion is early conflict prevention and early warning system. And early warning system. Go back to where we are from, the Anglophone crisis. Before the Anglophone crisis came, there was already a probability for you to predict that there will be a crisis. Because there were, there, there were already things which were very rampant. Teachers were complaining about the fact that um, the administrators were francophone. There were this conversation online, Facebook. There were people writing on newspapers. There were calls, there were voice notes. When it started in 2017, uh, um, um, uh, there were already signs that this would happen. It was going to go severe. And now the, when the crisis started, we went to how we somehow advocate open the conflict in a way that we will share things and the, the, um, the military is coming, run and hide, let's go and strike. And this is what AI has been doing. Recently, people have been using the whole AI thing, writing, cell, mobile, connectivity, to radio, media, to talk about how to, to, to come conflict, how to prevent it. For example, some few 
months back, years back, there was a thing about Moja Moja came online and he said Gaddafi should go back to their land. He did a video and posted it on social media, particularly. People saw that video. And the next thing was that they attacked him directly. They were like, why should he say such a thing? So this, in a way, pre preventing a conflict, because the next thing is he said in his video, I can very well remember, he's giving them three weeks to go back. Just imagine a situation where you've lived all your life in Boya, and now you have this guy telling you to go back to Bamenda. Where are you going up to? What are you doing? So how this came to pass was that when he said the video, which he was promoting conflict, saw it and they attacked him and they changed the narrative. They prevented it. There are also signs of early warning system where you can sit and say, okay, you're looking at the way things are going, the, 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 the national development plan or something's not working right. It's, it might lead to something and we start advocating. So when you look at the nexus between these, we start looking at preparedness and response capacity, how AI has had preparedness and response capacity in such a way that you can already predict about a conflict and you can prepare for it. You look at disaster risks knowledge, like you sit and think about, oh, the rainfall in Boom. In this month of April, there was heavy rainfall like last year and it killed so many people. Now you start going online and checking about what will be the rainfall in the month of April in 2025? And how can you prepare for it? What are the things you should stop? You start looking at, okay, maybe creating more balls, building walls, telling people to maybe stay in their house while it's rainy. And this is all already um, a chicken, a, a, a achieving at, uh, um, um, aspect about how AI is fostering us to prevent conflict or to prevent a particular situation in the future. We start looking at observation and monitoring analysis and forecast. Then you can now take your phone and say, is it going to be raining tomorrow? With the use of this system, which has been um, um, come, you can now detect if it will be raining tomorrow and how how uh, uh, rainy it's going to be. Is it good out? Is it good to know the weather condition, how cold it's going to be? You start looking at warning, dissimilarization, and communication, like what are the things you share online and things like that. Now, monitoring and combating hate speech is one of the things which AI has done. We can very well recall of a particular organization, Defy Hate Now in Cameroon, which focuses more on about combating hate speech. This is something we should look at, and this is what we can use our 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 our, our media to either promote or advocate for peace. The a point in time, like last two years, we saw videos training online of students going for matriculation at the University of Boya. And while they were walking into the Anfi, open Anfi, we saw another group of students who stood with their phones and they were mocking at them while they were coming, they would record videos and they would clap and they would post. It was all fun, but that could lead to depression for the people who are victims of this. And it's some kind of um, uh, cyber bullying to maybe make this guy to think that he's not enough or you're not better enough. And all these are things which social media or die has brought. We now have to identify and address the harmful contents which are being spread online. So AI helps to prevent these diverse rhetorics. Like there are things you cannot call on Facebook. There are things where you cannot post on Facebook. You can post very abusive videos because even there, AI has restricted this 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 aspect to promote a peaceful and coexist uh, coex a co existing society. We start looking at humanitarian response and crisis. Like how is AI contributing to humanitarian response? How is it that when there is something in there is something happening in in Cameroon, people are already ready to mobilize and help people? Look for example, Prof. Uh, um, uh, um, our own Antifeli, who is in USA. Recently, he launched the Antifelicia's Foundation, something which is very great. And he's been able to gather, raise so much money to, to help young people who have not been going to school for a while now. How has that been possible? It's because he had an online presence. People have been looking at him. Then he cannot push for an agenda which will be beneficial to a greater number of people. 
So AI helps to predict the affected community, helps to stabilize region and prevent conflict, helps to mitigate and provide what a community for itself cannot afford or cannot get. We look at peace education. This is us talking about how AI is helping us advocate for peace. By this, it's just saying that we are present in an online thing because of AI, because of a system where we don't know the algorithm which has been created. Then I can talk to my fellow youths about the intersection between peace and how we can further the knowledge about peace and paid more awareness through social media, through AI, and how do we go about it, and organizing meetings like this, talking about one another, about peaceful um, activities, sharing content, and all the like. We look about international peace and diplomacy. How is this happening? How is AI advocating for the voices of the unheard? Probably there is um, a future summit of the future in the US presently going on, which is a whole conversation where young people have been encouraged to participate in the event because they are talking about their future. For those of us who are not able to go because of work, because of school, because we don't have the money, we can participate online and still send our contribution. So in a way, AI has made it very easy for us to be there even if you're not physically present. It's been able to make us visibly say what we want to tell people, tell the world who we are, what we think, criticize things because of the presence of AI. So it's really an interconnected um, um, discussion which um, we can exploit at different angles. But for the purpose of the meeting, this is where I'll end with my, con my, 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 my sharing. And I'm open to questions. I'm open to share my perspective about different things. The part of which is I also have an organization which is um, in Cameroon. I'm not in Cameroon, I'm in Germany. And I'm into international development. Back in Cameroon, I was controlling the big human movement called the National Movement for Peace in Cameroon. I was coordinating the activity. And personally, I run an activity called the University Lecture on Peace in Africa, which is all aimed at um, bridging or preaching peace. So we hear out end, but then I'm open for questions and interactions and engage different engagements. Thank you. Thank you, Apa, for your presentation and uh, for those slides. Yeah, AI actually plays a uh, crucial role, either in preventing conflict or in um, promoting conflict. And we've seen that social media, which is the canal through which AI uh, is it's, it's, uh, uh, in the interference between uh, communities and social media, we have this common trend. And I think we've been victim of it. The common trend is disinformation and information. Many of us, we are fond of sharing information online, sharing uh, uh, um, text online without really verifying the source. And those who create those uh, those kind of text or those kind of information or video at times have the intent to to hurt. Just like Epa said in his uh, presentation about uh, Moja Moja calling on all graphic people to leave the Star Wars region within the context of this uh, Anglophone crisis, you will see that uh, a lot of people have been involved in this information. This information is, by definition, the spread of false information with the intent of hurting. Why misinformation is the spread of false information without verifying the source of the information? So many a times you will find yourself in your social media handle, that is uh, uh, WhatsApp. You find yourself being invited to share information forward. You also press the button forward without verifying the source. And before you want to realize, somebody has been hurt or it has been harmful to someone, be it financially or be it physically. So today, as we celebrate uh, the International Day on Peace, uh, we just see this opportunity that we spoke about AI to call on the attention of everyone to really verify the source of information before we share and make sure that we are agent of peace and not agent of Tribalism or sources or various sources of uh, of conflict. 
that said, I would like to know if we do have questions either from Mr. Ebune, who presented on community-based initiatives, or on or for Mr. Epa, who presented on uh, artificial the role of artificial intelligence in advocating for peace. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much for this session. I think I was able to pick uh, some points and my network is not the best. So I'll just really appreciate the slides after so I could go through after this session. Okay, Fiona, why coming for the uh for the webinar? I don't know, you've seen, you you are in Southwest, you see the conflict itself, you leave the conflict itself. I don't know if you do have any question at the community level or at the uh, social media level to know more about how to uh, prevent the escal further escalation of the conflict in the Southwest, if you do have any question with that, in that regard. Uh, for, I would say, um, as the first speaker gave, uh, threw some light about all about uh, community based peace building shit. I would just want to realize that the community plays a crucial role in advocating for peace, and the community also plays a role in escalating conflict. Yeah, that's what. Uh, so it all boils down to the community for the either to advocate for peace or the escalating issue, making it more worse than doing it. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's what I was able to get. Check Right. Uh, Mr. Ebuna, you said why uh, talking about community engagement, uh, community engagement in advocating for peace. You you made mention of something very essential. I'm um, talking about the uh, the participation of the youth in this conflict, in the manifestation of the conflict itself. That is the violent context of it. You see a lot of youth holding guns and being very excited on. Uh, in the figure and so on, and one of the is one of the reasons you push forward in your presentation is that uh, these youth are involved in this country because they are being unemployed. Now, the question I would like to know is: Do you think is it that they are educated and unemployed, or they are just uneducated and? Um, Unemployed wanting to be uh, occupied by being educated here. I'm talking about having followed a school curriculum, be it any themselves at the uh, advanced level. Because you're also looking at the solution towards uh, solving uh, peace and preventing uh, the escalation of violence or the occurrence of violence. Are you with us? Unfortunately, uh, it's not. But I, I think it is it is important it is important for us all at our level to keep on keep on sensitizing, educating our fellow youth that uh, violence has never been an an option to resolve. Neither has uh, the use of weapons been an alternative to discussion. Because when I see videos training on social media about uh, the, the, the ghost town or the burning of cars in the southwest and northwest, what I first notice is that they are youths between the age of 25 to 30 years. Most of them have been reached 40 years. And I think it's because they they are filled with the imagination that this is the only solution, this is the only way out. 
out to reach the target of having a, a peace or having what they want. And to me, it is important for us, if you have the opportunity to talk to them, to make them to understand or to lecture them about the, uh, either the Bakasi crisis, either about the Bakasi, uh, the Bakasi problem with the Bamiite, where a lot of people have, have died through the process of Matita, for them to reawake or for them to reconnect with the reality. And knowing that this is very uh, important. Yeah, I don't know. Do we have any question for Epa after his beautiful presentation on uh, the role of artificial intelligence in advocating for peace? Yes, I think I have another question. Okay. I want to know the first speaker, Mr. Epa, right? I want to know how can women be more involved in peace building activity in the local community, especially when the opportunities are given uh, mostly to men. So how can women be more involved in peace building activity? Thank you very much, um, Fiona. And um, Kieran, I've been raising my arm up because I wanted to contribute to the discussion about uh, okay. how to build peace. So answers, you know, then on how to maybe encourage then another uh, request. I think there is a mic of few nights um on mute. Maybe it has to be unmuted because not there's a popping sound coming from. Nice. So how can women be involved? They th again, I don't think. Um, it's a way for me to tell you women can be involved. Like, women have to do this. The Cameroon system is very hostile. So I, I am just from doing an article, which is uh, the title of the article is about to be published. It's called The Silence Execution. Why most women in Cameroon don't go to political po positions. And it's funny to know that since independence, we've had, we've never had a prime minister who is a who is a woman out of thirteen prime ministers. Do you know that there are ten um, governors in the whole of Cameroon and none is a woman? There are 50, 58 subdivisional officers, just two are women. There are three hundred and sixty divisional officers, and just eight are women. There are 41 military generals and colonels, none is a woman. There are 10 regional presidents in Cameroon, none is a woman. This is where we come from. The society will not give a woman a chance. Though there are so many um, gender parity rules that Cameroon has ratified, the Maputo Protocol, and so many different protocols, but the, the, the institutionalization of it is very low. So if you say, how can women go, like really get involved during the space, it has to be a system where you are in it. So as part of the National Women Convention for Peace in Cameroon, which I am a coordinator of it, um, in the light of all the regions in Cameroon, all the 10 regions, we have members from all 10 regions, all women peace builders. And particularly in 2019, when we had a national dialogue, they invited four women for the dialogue with over 1,000 applications that went out and the nine committees that had, there were just four women from the peace building fee. But at the end, eight men went to, into, the, into the hall. So if they don't take you to the hall, if they don't create you, if they don't give you a space to the hall, take your chair into the hall and sit on your chair. So what happened when they give four and nine people entered? The four who had invitations entered. And when they entered the hall, they came out, took their invitation card, gave it to the next person. And the next person took it inside the hall and entered the hall and participated. The genuine truth about when conflict happens is that men face a lot during conflict. You never hear a story like a boy was raped by ambas. The boy will be shot and that will be all. But you as a girl, if you go to somewhere, you will be raped. And you might be shot after that. You face more, 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 more problems. During conflict, I'm able to run. 
But then what, how do you hold when you're menstruating? How do you sleep in the forest without a pot? I, am, I sleep very comfortably. Men, for them, they can bait even where women are, but you cannot because immediately you move your dress, women men already feeling the urge of. So it's very tr tr a tricky question because what happens in women creating space in community peace building is that they have to become part of it. They have to, they have to talk about their problem. They have to make people know about their problem. You have to talk about it. Men won't talk about it. I think there are a few like me who talk about women equality and bringing women to the table. But then this is not the reality in Cameroon. People won't bring it. So if you want to get involved in real community process, there are so many avenues where you can go talk about things. Talk about gender-based violence, talking about um, women empowerment programs, equality and equity for women and men. You go back to the community. Go back to the, the local people. Tell them about the place. Why is it that a woman should not eat a gizzard? These are socially constructed values which has defined us and we, we are living very, very far with it. Like if a woman eats a gizzard, it's an abomination. Why? Who made those laws? What is the intriguing um, thing about a woman not eating that? So you have to challenge these norms and you have to push to the angle where you become very visible about the things that you do, the things that people feel very okay and normal. And by this, you can do so many things in your community. You can hold different programs. You can engage in different discussions. You can just be that person who um, you gather the mothers in the quarter and talk to them about their role building a peaceful community, what they should do. You can be that person who will talk to their mothers that it is good for you to tell your, do your, your girl child about sex education when she's still young. To us, society has made us, it's, 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 it's taboo for, me, for your mom to tell you, take this condom and go with it and work with it. What if you're about to be raped and you have somebody say, I want to rape you and you give the condom. But these are things that mothers will not say because of past um, thinking and most do not go through formal education to know, actually know that it is good to maybe tell your child that at 14, you start seeing your menses and your breasts will start coming out. You start having the urge of people start talking to you. They don't talk. So you still find this whole thing of when you start experiencing to, to young girls and female genital mutilation, it still happens even in Boya. It's still very recurrent. So there are so many avenues where you can enter and change these norms. But just know it takes courage. It takes zeal. It takes power to do it because you're changing a thinking of a whole generation. I don't know if I've answered your question, Fiona. Um, yes, thank you very much. It was very insightful. And thank you, Alice. I've gotten an understanding. Okay. Now, part well, of what we are wanting. Yes, I wanted to. I wanted to react on what you said about um, uh, women being more involved at policy level. Now, I, I, I want to. Yes, the statistics you've given are uh, quite all right in terms of if it's a divisional officer, the So the point, the point, the essential point to to to, to know here is that ten years ago, that was not the situation. The statistics were worse than than what is today, and you know, uh, women at the political perspective in Cameroon, they are not yet very much invested in into politics. So the uh, government the government policy is that we will get women progressively represented, represented their constituency at the parliament. Now we have one hundred and eighty parliament and out of that I think one third of them are women. So even if the number is not Yet, uh, as expected by the vast majority of people, the, the, the women who represent the community already participate at policy making at the level of the National Assembly. Again, when we talk about peace building and the government initiative towards sustaining peace in uh, in the southwest or in the, in the country affected region of the northwest, 
they realize that the government, the president, the president, the president has to establish what we call the public independent conciliator. What is the role of the public independent conciliator? They play a very important role in solving problems at the local level. And Boya is so blessed that they have a woman managing in the name of uh, telling her, uh, Motaze, who's Motaze, who is yeah, who is running that institution, who is running that institution to her primary mission is not to save the government of Yaoundé. The primary mission is to save the, the people of the Southwest. And when we talk about the people of the Southwest, we're not talking about only the Bakorians, we're talking about all Cameroonians living in the Southwest and having problems with the administration. Don't forget one of the reasons why uh, one of the reasons uh, push forward for this for, of the Anglophone crisis is that the Anglophone complaint to the marginalized administration, the complaint of poor administrative service, the complaint of uh, corruption within the uh, the administration. So the public independent conciliator has been put in place as an independent uh, 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 body that will solve problems that between the the, the uh, citizens or the population and the local administration. So if you have a problem at the council, at the divisional office, at the, uh, uh, the sub-divisional officer, even at the governor office or the regional assembly, don't forget this institution. You can reach out to uh, the office of the public independent consultant, which is headed by the woman in the South West, to solve your problem. And when you look at her activity, she has been First, on the mission of sensitizing the population, because a lot of the, the, the population don't know the, 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 the role of their office, don't know the uh, existence of their office within the community. So, uh, to, to, to summarize what I just said, I, I think, Fiona, your, your question, women are progressively being represented in peace building initiatives. The, the, the progress here is can be one to two percent every year because the, the, the former government the former uh, uh, government we had lesser women represented but this current government now which is headed by uh, chief dissolution we have more women represented and we hope that in future we have more and more women have, having position of responsibilities Thank you very much, Kilian. Just going back to your argument, it's a very interesting one. And I am a gender activist. I know what I'm talking, I'm talking out of experience. And yes, we have women in positions of power, but they, they are not powerful. They are window dressings. They are not. Instead, in the past what, um, what 10 years, someone you know, said, someone said, you, in the past, there were more <laughs> women who represented who uh, were in these positions than even now. Dorothy Njoma was one of, in 2025, was a minister of state, a minister. Tell me whose minister you know now. There are four ministers of state uh, who are ministers. There is no like a woman. I can give you the statistics very clear. In the parliament, we have 180 parliamentarians. 61 are women. I'm not saying that they are not represented. The in 2019, um, Minister Paul Tasson gave it as statistics in women make 51 percent of Cameroon's population. So, if you are 30 million people, women are like 70 million people. Now, this is what we have been happening between 2010 to 2019. We had 300 political parties and just 13 women. Prime Minister, we've had 13 Prime Minister. He has never been a woman. We have four state ministers, no woman. We have 38 ministers, five women, five women. We have 100 senators, 33 women. We have 180 parliamentarians, 61 women. We have 10 governors, zero women. We have uh, 58 senior division officers, two women. We have 360 uh, division officers, 15 women. We have 10 regional presidents, no woman. We have 900 regional councillors, just 207 and are, are, are women. And this was created in 2020. We have 360 municipal councillors, just 90 are women. We have 360 mayors, just 39 are women. We have 50 military generals. There is no woman. Now, 
it's an encouragement from the past years. But tell me, Cameroon spent his higher budget on the military, which is the higher level. You've not had a woman in that representation. There is no equality you can tell me about that because Cameroon as a country has rectified different convention starting from the 1948 convention on human declaration of human rights which article 2 and article 21 articulates very clearly about women representation in uh, and, and in political rules you have the international convention of civil and political rights yeah, established it is not stated that have, it is uh, equal representation they are represented even if the number is inferior we have this is what i'm that. saying this is what I'm, I'm not saying they are not represented. It, it's not even imaginable that you have 10 governors and they, the women are not represented. And it's not like they are not able to, 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 to manage those positions. Kill, and I know very well, this is Fiona. Fiona is a mother. She will not embezzle so much like a man if you are put in that position. Let's be very frank, because she will think of her children. A man would think about his side chicks. Fiona will think about her children and what they have to eat. So I'm not saying that they are not represented. I'm only saying that in our present contemporary society, this should not be happening. Do you know Rwanda is the highest country in the world with over 60% of the population of, of administrators being women, women? So it's a very interesting dynamics to look at when you're looking at um, the whole argument about... Um, involving women in positions i feel you know very clearly that women are better administrators they are punctual they are better administrators than men and it's 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 a thing because you talk about them representing in this thing let me tell you i right? go back to the elecam law and look at there is no binding agreement about women representation in running for offices. There is no binding law. I can give you the Elecam article. Article 5, 151, subsection 3, does not put the, the, it as a compulsory criteria for women to be in a political setting. Like, for example, if you guys have to have a political party of 10 people, seven or three of them should be women. It's not binding. So they don't still give women the place in that position. When we talk about equality and equity, which are uh, SDG rules, equality, it's giving equal opportunities to everyone. And you might say women are not empowered. How do they empower if you don't want programs to empower them? How do you, how do they? And you, you can very well know children that as much as you can articulate it, there are men who are good. There are also women who are very good. Even when you put them within a space like Look, look, look at your lecturers. You've maybe attended two lecturers who are very good. This woman is really good. This woman, this man is really good. But because you come from a society where women are not giving spaces, they are they are giving those spaces which are spit and places like you be a secretary under this person. And even the office of a public conciliator. I know the, the, the mother very well. She knows me. Anytime you go to her, ask her about her her her, her very good friend. He's called Epa. Epa from uh, Fongo. So that's the person who gave me my name is a very good friend. I know her very well. And you start looking at the narrative of her position. How independent is her has her office? How independent is her office? It still ends up at one person's Minister of Territorial Administration the, in Yaoundé signing decrees. So even if you're giving the thing, you're controlled from a bigger perspective. Ministers, Prime Ministers, so we are talking about this position, this rule. How many, there are 300 political parties in Cameroon, apart from Kawalai and the two others that we know. How many can you call who are political leaders? So we I'm not saying that they are not. All women to get involved in politi political affairs. Ah? Uh -huh. Because the issue, I think perhaps we have to invite more women to get involved in political affairs because the issue also has to do with. How many of them are there politically educated and interested and willing no. to uh, bear the cause of political leader? So that's it. Uh, thank you for your presentation and thank you for your explanation. I've learned a lot about it.
and uh, we look forward that you know giving more power. Do we have uh, any question? Mr. Bune is back, and the question was asking to Mr. Bune is to know whether or not the uh, unemployed youth who are involved into the uh, current and current conflict uh, are they into the conflict simply because they they, they are excited or with their own way of being busy. And if you were, you were given uh, an opportunity to address the issue, how would you uh, tackle the issue of the uh, youthful participation into this um, conflict? Now, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bianda, for that question. Now, I want to start off by saying that you two are involved in this conflict as uh, fighters, they are not in there because of excitement. Uh, I want to point out the fact that some of them are there because they have been brainwashed, one. Some of them are there because they are for revenge. Maybe they lost uh, their loved ones, mom, dad, and stuff like that. And because of the society where we live in, lack of sensitization and education, proper education, some of them decided to pick up arms. I personally have lost uh, a bunch of friends or childhood friends, let me put it that way, with whom we grew up uh, in Kumba together and they got involved in this conflict. They were not excited going there for the sake of going there or excitement, but they, they went there because maybe their mom or dad or a relative was killed. And so they felt like there's a need for them to go and revenge. That is the first thing. And I equally think that that we can better address the situation by uh, sensitization, like I said, like main mention of. We may want to bring in as many stakeholders as possible, like uh, I think the, the previous speaker, Mr. Epa, mentioned of something like that, where we can school people. You, you, you can go to the community, take it up as a responsibility upon yourself to educate people in your community. Tell them, okay, this is what you have to do. This is what you shouldn't do. If you get to do this, it's going to result to this. There is there's no need for us to keep on fighting uh, a senseless war. I beg your pardon, just permit me to put it that way. And if we rather get ourselves involved, maybe when I talk about stakeholders bring, uh, getting involved into realizing peace at the end, we may want to partner with some vocational training uh, centers or yeah, centers like that, where we can get these youths registered. At so much so that they can pick up skills that is going to keep them busy over a very long period of time. Because trust me, when people are idle, and uh, I always say this, the way we think, 95% of the way we think, the, thing, the things we do and the things we say, it's as a result of our ecosystem. When I talk about our ecosystem, I talk about uh, the friends who are around us. I talk about uh, the society where we find ourselves, the content we consume from the music to the movies and every other discussion that we have. This is all the ecosystem. But now if we get these youths actively involved where they can go to vocational trainings, they start learning skills, they will definitely want to be focused on uh, enhancing their skills to making money. But at a time when somebody sleeps for one, two days without eating, and then they have a friend who is with the voices in the bush, and <laughs> I beg your pardon, voices in the bush, and they, they come tell you that, okay, we are fighting every month, they give us this amount, we, we, we always eat, we do this and do that. You, you, you hear these stories, you, you have some of them in the villages, you hear these stories. That person who is idling will definitely feel the urge to go and join them. And they'll definitely give you some convincing talks or uh, point like, okay, we you don't for house, you do not wait, these people they don't kill us. All those kind of talks. But if we put ourselves together to sensitize our communities, to talk to the youths, I, I feel like we can bet they can better relate with us because we are all youths. We we know how we can better approach this. And but before we go to uh, talking with the youths, maybe we want to go on workshops where organizations like I mentioned, Web, Web Africa and uh, Work Cameroon, we build, can always uh, build these skills in us, these communication skills and many other ways that we can go and have a conversation with these uh, youths without being, with our lives not being at stake. Because you don't just want to approach them for the sake of, okay, we all go up together. No, you have to do it professionally. You need to be smart in, in, in uh, going to talk to these people. So I think that's it. Okay. Uh, just to run on with you. Uh, uh, what's the way forward? 
what's the way forward in terms of community based initiatives? Please, please. Now, the way forward is taking the problem to the core, going back to the community. That is the way forward. We cannot just stay back here. Like I mentioned, we cannot stay back here in the cities without doing anything. And then we keep on organizing workshops every now and then. Uh, personally, I've, I've attended a couple of uh, workshops and, 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 and seminars here in Boya. But when I want to look at the implementation rate of those who attend these uh, workshops, it is really low. It is really, really low. I, I, I'm very serious. And most of us, we are only there on social media. We are like whistleblowers. We are only there on social media to, to social media to, to to post these things. Okay, I was there. We said we said this. This was said. And and when you come, you have the the, the the likes and the comments. You feel like you're doing something. No, we have to go to the grassroots. That is where the problem is. The problem is get each and every member in our different communities, our local communities, involved. We may want to partner with uh, the elites from our different communities. You, we we know that most of them would not like to go down there, but if you if you go partner with these elites, asking for fun as a team or uh, a body, an organization or whatsoever, they definitely are going to give you some sort of backup. I don't know financially or maybe you no. Know, let's not use the military here because it might it might constrain things along the line. But they, they may want to give you uh, technical knowledge and financial assistance. So we can go back to the grassroots. I feel like if we go back to our grassroots, we, we discuss with our peers uh, in our different languages, our uh, mother tongues, we can easily communicate. It is often said that the way people perceive they were based on the language they speak. And it is easy for you to understand me and see me as your brother because we speak the same language. But at a point where uh, you, you bring another person who doesn't speak my language, it becomes a little bit difficult for me to really understand and relate with that person. So I think the way forward is uh, for organizations and as uh, CBOs to go back to their roots. They should empower more youths and send them back to their roots so that we can talk to those youths, those mama and papa who are there in the villages. It is very, very essential. Thank you. Thank you very much for your inviting fight. Um, uh, please, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Please, my my question is, given the fact that youths are very instrumental in in bringing peace in Cameroon or contributing, I said, given the fact that youths are very instrumental in contributing peace, contributing to peace in Cameroon. However, very few youths are actually actively involved in it, most shy away. And mm -hmm. partly it's because they don't feel they don't feel um they don't feel like they are part of it. They don't feel be, they don't feel like they, 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 they don't have a sense of belonging. They mm -hmm. see like no it's it's for the older people. So my question is how do we get the youth to be actively involved in peace building in Cameroon? Now, okay, uh, a quick one. We can get the youths actively involved in peace building processes in Cameroon in many different ways. Let me go back again to uh, the countryside. Maybe we want to organize um, football tournaments. It is very common. We see it happening in many other communities. We want to organize these kind of tournaments where we keep these youths active. And maybe during the uh, committee meetings, because they always have those things, I hear them talk about it a lot. We, we can go there time after time, we, we preach to them, we, we say, I mean, like, not those of us really based in Boya, but maybe we want to go down there and then we try to empower community leaders. I made mention of community leaders in these institutions, some uh, corporations in the village and village heads and leaders. We want to empower them, make them show them those opportunities that they can exploit. And the football tournament is one of them. We organize a football tournament. We tell them, OK, once this is going on, during such moments, you guys can preach this, you guys can say this and say that. Another thing, uh, the civic, I think <laughs> the civic education is really, really important, really, really important in our, in our schools. Uh, in as much as we have the conflict in Cameroon, the war in Cameroon, 
uh, we still have people who are going to school, youths who are going to school, some of them coming from the villages. And as they come to school in the cities and towns, we may want to create clubs, civic education clubs, where they will be schooled on peace building and all these stuff, so much so that when they go back to their respective villages, they can uh, discuss this with their peers, they can discuss with, the, with their parents, and it becomes uh, a little bit difficult for someone to convince them because kids or youths, most times, teenagers, most times, are difficult to convince. They always believe so much in their teachers and what they have, they have been taught in school. So we can use this, some of these approaches towards uh, achieving or getting more youths involved in peace building processes in uh, Cameroon. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Epa. Do you have any question? Just to maybe add to, just to maybe add to what um Ibune just said. I think for me, it's very simple, right? <clears throat> for me, it's very simple. There is always the conversation of what can we do from time to time, time to time, and the genuine and the practical truth is that most of the times these things don't happen. From a perspective of the young people, what we should do is that encourage people to tell people nice things. When was the last time you appreciated someone on your social media handle and make this person feel loved? Should the mood of effort come out to the Will you stand with the many people who condemn Epa? positive, we condemn people very fast. Go to better things when they post something, read the. When now post something that is right, people. So even us, we see ourselves in the situation, people not give why it's their life. Let's go back. Let's let it start from us. Take out tomorrow. Take out Sunday. See, read a very one one opportunity about someone. If person done something and you really like, tell him you like it, and he's inspiring you. You might never know where that. And by me, by this, they are being this. Not tomorrow that he is looking up me. Then I cannot go and do anything illegal. I don't Actually, if I make if I make work as uh, okay, he's back. Yes, if uh, we are with you, what's the way forward? What's the way forward with the role of uh, artificial intelligence in uh, advocating for peace in this country? Hello, Epa. Hello? Yeah, Epa, uh, the question is to know what Hello? is the way forward. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, hear me now. Yes, we yes, can hear yes, you. can hear you. The, the question yeah. is to know now what is the way forward with the role of artificial intelligence in um, advocating for peace in our community or in contemporary times? Hello, did you hear me? Okay, the way forward. Okay. Yeah, the way forward. The network is really. I don't know if it's that of Q or is that of me. I wonder, I wish to ask. Does anybody get what I say clearly? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I got your question. Yeah. But I wonder mm -hmm. if you, you're here to say. Yes. What is we should promote positive, positive
think uh, uh, um, Hepas Network has failed us, but we'll proceed given that we are against time. And before giving the uh, the, the before giving uh, the, the uh, opportunity to um, Miss Pauline, the co founder of Fem Africa, to say something, I would like us to take home this um, short statement from the Constitution of the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which is UNESCO, which it is in the mind of men that the defense of peace must be constructed. So that said, I in invite each and every one of us to preach uh, to be good officers of uh, peace, uh, tolerance, togetherness, and always prioritize discussion over violence in any conflict you found yourself, be it at school, be it in your neighborhood, be it in your family, be it in your relationship. So that's it, uh, Ms. Pauline, you have the floor. Hello to everyone. It was or it is a very interesting webinar where youths like us, everyone is trying to express themselves on how we can be better individuals, how we can improve on our society. Ilian, thank you so much for moderating this event. Thank you for every all participants, Fiona, Orok, Epa. I appreciate you all. So the team was cultivating a culture for peace. Culture is very important. And culture is about generations. It's about sustainability. How do you want to make it sustainable? So next week or next month, yeah, next month, we're going to host another event. And how, how can we improve and how can we involve more older persons or seniors in a society for them to be better individuals? How can we support them? And this will be hosted by Fiona, who is from the humanitarian department, because on the 1st of October, it's the day celebrated for older persons. So I invite you all to come and attend the webinar and share your ideas and your, and your inputs. So this is the end of this webinar. And thank you so much to everyone, especially to Epa and Ebune. It was a pleasure meeting you all and see you guys next time. Thank you very much, ma'am. And sorry, before we Thank end... Thank you very much, ma'am. Sorry, before we end, please, can you put your, your video on so I can take a picture? I'm going to upload it on our social media handles as well as YouTube. So when I upload the videos, I'm going to share the link with Killian and you share with you guys. And please don't forget to send your presentation as well. Please, can you put on your videos for a picture? Yeah, you were saying something. No, just put your, put your video on just for a picture. Okay, okay. Yeah, just put your video on. All right, please. Okay, thank you. It's good. Thank you. All right, bye. Thank you very much to everyone who participated. Thank you very much to Epa to have created time out of your busy schedule to be to be here. Thank you very much to Mr. Ebune for all the sacrifice and loyalty that you've shown for this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you very much to Siona uh, to for your support to Kate. and to uh, WEM Africa for the opportunity that we, we have to share on an important topic which concerns each and every one of us, which has to do with peace. All right. We, we keep the communication active in our various chat groups and in our various communities. 
And don't forget, WEM Africa is always available for any opportunity that you think it's very necessary in addressing issue of peace. And as a reminder, WEM Africa is divided to several departments, which has to do with conflict management, capacity building, gender equality, human rights, and humanitarian actions, and uh, other activities. So you are welcome to WEM Africa, and welcome to uh, to uh, accept the invitation of WEM Africa. All right, guys. Happy weekend to each and every one of us, and happy International Day. Peace, International Day. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.